Yeah, so you need to wake up. I know that this day is tiring and I'm also sleepy, by the way. So if you feel sleepy, feel free to sleep, like, don't worry. Um, I always like to start, like, my presentations with, like, weird things. Like, I tell you a story. I did this, like, public speaking course. I think that was in university times. And there they speak about, like, different stages of every presentation, where you have to have, like, this introduction, body, clincher, whatever. And there is this section that's called, like, attention grabber. And this is basically about this... Like how the speaker gets on the stage and tries to like grabs everyone's attention in the room, right? So you would find people like asking a question that's like kind of the, the traditional way or popping like a story. Uh, and I was talking yesterday to Jessica actually and I was telling her like, yeah, I used to do this thing where I would bring like this big prop on the stage and just put it there and people are like, what is he going to do with it and just do nothing? So, <laughs> but then like on a darker note, I moved to Europe in 2013 and something weird started to happen because being a person of color, having this sort of hair, having my body size, you have enough attention in the streets and stages that you don't need that anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, as uh, mentioned, uh, my name is Amr Abdel Oheb. Super hard name, don't worry about that. I'm basically a software engineer like most of the people in the room here, right? I mostly come from the Ruby community. I do mostly backend, so I'm not so much on the reactive side of things. Um, and I, like I, before starting my talk, or before starting any talk I gave in the past, I usually try to say this sentence. Over the years, over my 12 years in this industry, I learned one thing. People and community matter the most. So regardless of how technical excellence is important, which is really important, right? But we are still building things with people for people. So communities and people matter the most. I was born and raised in Cairo, in North Africa. And then in 2013, I moved to your neighboring country, Hungary. Uh, lived in Budapest uh, for a bit. And then lately in 2017, I moved to your other neighboring country, Germany, and uh, I live in Berlin. So before I start, I mean, I was even asking myself this question, like why do I need to give this talk and why me, right? It's important to mention that this is not going to be an expert talk. So I'm not here to give you like an expert opinion about the topic. That's not the case. It's more of a talk of my heart, right? Like it was more like of a rant from your fellow developer to some fellow developers. And as much as many people always consider these kind of talks to be relevant on these stages, right? It's very relevant because it impacts the life of myself, probably hundreds of thousands of your colleagues. And as I will try to show you later, it also impacts your product. It impacts your output as well. Uh, the second thing is why specifically me is giving this talk at the moment. I think I have this interesting thing where I have this two sides of the, of the coin, let's, as they say. So I come from this kind of privileged background. My parents are kind of middle to high class Egyptian family. And they, they are Muslim, so I belong to the Muslim community, which is in Egypt as a, is a privilege on its own. And sad, sadly to say that I have the lighter shade of black, which is in North Africa still considered a privilege compared to the darker ones, like my brother, for example, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm straight, cisgender male, so I was checking all these boxes, basically. I was checking all the boxes, and I remember in the past, like, before moving to Europe, I was confronted by people sometimes, right, like people from the Christian community in Egypt or the LGBT friends or women. They would start to complain about things, and I felt sympathy, sympathy like I was really feeling sad, but deep, deep inside, I had always this question, why are those people so sensitive about this topic, right? Like, why are they making a big fuss? Why do we have to bring this question in every single conversation we have to talk? And I have to admit, I fell a lot for these fallacies, like repeating things without really understanding them and thinking that, oh, I am so smart, I cracked it, and those people are just not smart enough to understand what I understand now. And then I moved to Europe in 2013, as I mentioned. And there is this moment where you start to feel like every day people are just looking down to you without you changing nothing, right? So it, you were like somewhere and now you're somewhere else and you don't understand. I mean, this statement here, you need to do 10 times more effort to achieve the same result, is a statement that was told to me by my German manager at some point. He was like, you're a brown person, you need to do this 10, 10 times more so that people accept it. And he was not saying this as an advice. I was facing things that today I am calling racist behaviors everywhere, all the time. At the beginning, I did not call them like that, right? I was questioning myself, maybe I am the one now that's becoming this oversensitive person, right? Or maybe I'm doing something wrong, maybe I still cannot adapt or whatsoever. You start to question yourself actually before you actually question the others. 
So I was like, okay, this is not a new topic, right? I'm not reinventing the wheel. Like there is hundreds of years of literature and universities and faculties and people doing stuff about that. Read about it, try to do some research. And then that was the moment you realized that your whole life you're just missing the context. You're just looking at the problem as if it's a mathematical problem while it's not. So I decided that I need to come to conferences like this or meetups and try to target individuals who, like myself in the past, today are unintentionally damaging their peers. And I insist on this unintentionally, because if you intentionally damage someone, you're not welcomed in this room, you're not welcomed in this community, so please leave. And I will try as much as I can in the next few minutes to, to add as much context to this topic, right? So, the presentation will go through different steps. At the beginning, I will try to speak from, like, what is privilege, try to give you, like, some arguments, uh, and fallacious arguments and how to answer them, then I will try to focus on the pragmatic aspect and how does it impact your product, and then I will try to give you some tips. So the question of privilege. People like to do this weird thing in presentations where they put like this Wikipedia definition and then they start to read it loudly and slowly and like this never works. And especially when it's about social sciences, never ever check dictionary definitions because it's wrong. Because that just simply ignores the context. So I was trying to come up, okay, how can I explain to people in a simpler way, very overly simplified way, what is a privilege, right? So I was like, I came up with this game. So try in your brain now to calculate your privilege score. <laughs> so if you can, at any moment, just take, up, take out your phone now and like write on Twitter or Facebook any post whatsoever you want without ending up being in jail, murdered, in exile, that's a plus one for yourself. Let me tell you a quick story. I come from Egypt. And just in the past one month, there are more than 3,000 people arrested for Facebook posts. 3,000 people. That's triple the amount of people in this conference just being in jail right now because they wrote something on Facebook. If you can go to someone at any moment and say, I love you, right? I'm a straight person, so I get a plus one here. But imagine, imagine being an LGBT community member in Russia or in Egypt or in many other countries. You still today get murdered, right? You still today get prosecuted for that. That's a privilege. You're not aware because you just go to sell people, I love you. Very commonly in software conferences, there is this talk about remote work and digital nomading and whatsoever. And then in my brain, it's always computing to like, give me a visa and I will do that, right? So this is a privilege, like just your ability to work wherever you want and live wherever you want and all this kind of thing is a privilege, right? People are not as welcomed as you are everywhere, and you're not aware of that. Another example is if you have Muhammad as your second name, as I do, you are always, for some reason, selected randomly in the random selections of the security of the airport. I don't know. I can keep going on with this list, I don't know, until tomorrow. But in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say here is that privilege is not something that's set in stone, right? Privilege changes based on the context. It's very coupled to its context. So as I said, being part of the Muslim community in Egypt is a privilege, but here it's not. Privilege is very intersectional. So you checking one of the boxes or under checking one of the boxes is not enough because you being, for example, a white woman, you are still more privileged than a black woman. Of course, much less privileged than a white man. And you cannot just ignore one aspect of privilege at a time. You cannot say, I am only defending women or I am only defending black people. It's all intersecting. You cannot ignore one aspect over the other. But the most important thing of this talk is that when I'm calling you privileged, I'm not calling you evil. So privilege is not something that is evil. Privilege is simply the statement that you need to do extra efforts or you have some extra duties that you need to do. And then the question always pops up here, wait, I did nothing wrong. I was just born into this. Why do I need to do more efforts? And let me ask you a question. Who here is maintaining a legacy code base or used to do it in the past? I mean, I think majority of us at some point inherited some project from someone. And you need to think that when you inherit this project, you know for sure that the previous developers did their best. Like, you know that they tried to do the best for this project and they tried to build, I don't know, cool stuff. But in some situations, someone from the business came to them and said, ah, oh, we need this as fast as possible. I don't know, hack it somehow. So they had to build these incomplete solutions because the business asked for it. Or, I don't know, they cannot anticipate the future. So they, built, they took some uninformed decision and they built something that is not good. 
or they just came to reactive conf and some person was speaking about i don't know microservices or serverless or mongodb or whatsoever there and then they just wanted to follow a hype without understanding which i'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with the situation this here introduces what all of us in this room agree to call technical debt right it's not something that you did it's something that people in the past did everyone in this room agrees with this and when you are dealing with technical debt you cannot simply ignore it, right? You cannot say, ah, oh, no, nothing happened in the past, I will just keep shipping, I don't care. And then you end up with a code base that's not maintainable in like two weeks. You also cannot rewrite everything from the beginning because then you will end up rewriting everything every week. The way to deal with technical de debt is simple. You keep shipping, you keep moving forward, but you have to be mindful of what happened in the past. So try to imagine, there is a 200,000 years old project Billions of developers have worked on this project. And unlike your software projects, they had Hitler. Not everyone was like having the best intentions, right? So everything is super coupled, everything is complex, everything is badly documented, everything is not secure, and there are no automated tests. I mean, obviously this project exists and we are all maintaining this, right? Like we are all maintaining this humanity. We, are all, we all inherited this project. We need to keep shipping, but we need to keep being mindful of what happened in the past. One last thing about the definition is this industry. This industry really tends to remove the context. I understand this in code. I understand that you want to have single responsibility like objects that make sense in code. You want to have isolated, decoupled, decoupled services that make sense in your coding world. You want to have technology agnostic, platform agnostic, whatever I put before agnostic, I don't know, developers really love it. But this does not apply to social sciences. You cannot go and say, ah, one plus one equal two. It doesn't work like that. There is context and you need to understand it in order to be able to analyze anything. So in the next section, I will try to focus on some of these arguments that very, very, very often, I mean, people who use it, use it on a daily basis and they think that they are so smart and that they crack the code. And the other thing is that sadly, sometimes it can happen from even underprivileged people. That can be a talk on its own. Why does that happen? But let's start with the first one, intention versus impact. I think it's very common when someone complains about uh, racist, sexist, transphobic behavior in any situation, the answer is always he did not mean it. I don't know why, he always did not mean it, and he here is intentional. Um, intention is not really relevant when you're damaging someone. Um, let me tell you this, I don't really care about you being racist or not racist. I care that what you just did is an act of racism. I don't really care about you as a person. Let's think about this example. You are in a park and you're throwing a frisbee. If it hits my face and got me concussion, you still need to apologize and you still need to take me to the hospital, regardless of you meant it or not. On the other hand, many people, I'm sure many people in the software industry do good things but they don't understand why. For example, let's go to women who code and try to support there and try to coach there. If you don't understand, if you think that you're doing this because you are nice, then you are missing the point. You're doing this because it's important. You're doing this because you are a big part of this problem, right? So it's very important to understand why are you doing good things as well, not just doing them because everyone else is saying it's cool. The second thing is, I don't know who, if anyone here heard about this Black Lives Matter uh, campaign that was in the US a couple of years ago. So it was basically a response to the American police killing much more black people. That's a statistical fact, right? There was this other campaign, an opposing campaign that said, all lives matter, it's not just black lives people that matter and all this kind of stuff. Black Lives Matter was not about the fact that like, black people are more important. That was never the intention there, right? The intention there was trying to point out the, the, the thing that black lives people are not like relatively undervalued in the US. They're trying to point out the statistical issue and they're trying to push the country to recognize this inequity and perhaps bring it to an end. Maybe a good way to think of it is this black lives matter too. I think this maybe would sum up what I'm trying to say in this.
Why am I saying this? I mean, this is obviously like a very political, very non-related thing. You have no idea how relevant this is to our reality every single day. Because every single woman I have seen in my life complaining to a, a male colleague about uh, an issue from the manager, he's always complaining with things like, oh, we are all under the same oppression. No, you are not. You just simply don't know. No, you are not. You, you might think that you are under the same, but you are not. The same goes for a white person when you tell him something. No, you are not. Um, sadly, I don't have time to show this video, but I will share the slides so you can check this video later. It's amazing about the concept of microaggressions. So we will have to go through this. The last argument I want to mention is this argument of this is being racist against uh, white people or this is being sexist against men. This person here is saying like being straight heterosexual male on Twitter in 2018 is harder than it was being openly homosexual in the US in 1960s. A perfect example of how you remove context from a privileged <laughs> argument, right? Because I have never, and please tell me if you have ever heard about this, heard about a straight male being murdered or arrested for the, sa for the case of being a straight male. Never happened. But this is still happening today in our world. I think maybe it always reminds me of like a British person coming to me and saying it's not fair that they don't have an independence day. Like, it doesn't work like this. So, no, it's not racism against white people or sexism against men, because it doesn't have an attached historical baggage. There is no history there to support this claim. There is no power imbalance. There, is all, there always has to be this power imbalance to be called oppression. Um, to sum it up, what I'm trying to say is that we are not trying to seek giving everyone equal attention. This is not what we're trying to say. What we are trying to seek is giving everyone equity and liberation. Maybe this is a good way to also explain this. And eventually, we should be able to knock out this wall and all feel liberated and move on. So that was it about the ethical part, let's say. But is it only a question of ethics, right? There is a question of pragmatism here. There is a question of a value added to your product. Um, I try to, in the next few slides, to show you like, some examples of how much impact does this thing have on, on your product. The famous last name issue, which is so not famous. So if I ask anyone who's a back-end engineer in the world, including myself at some point, how would you model a user in the database? The answer always includes the field's first name, last name, email, password, whatsoever. There is a very clear implicit assumption there that every single person that will use your application has a first and a last name. And this assumption is a perfect example of what we, what's called the false consensus effect. False consensus effect is a cognitive bias where we as people tend to think that everyone else has the same habits, have the same thoughts, have the same... We always think the same. We always think that, ah, oh, we are just like everyone else. I will start with a surprise. I don't have a last name. So as 100 million Egyptians, we have a totally different naming conventions. And I'm pretty sure there are other nations in the world that have the same problem. And this might seem like very trivial to you, but you have no idea how much issues I ran into the past because of the fact that I don't have a last name and I have to make up some last name from my passport and go through this hell that the bank doesn't accept this as the last name and, and whatsoever. Just because you wanted to split the name in the database, I don't know why, but you wouldn't have even thought of that because you don't have someone diverse to tell you that. There is this amazing GitHub repo called the awesome falsehood of programming. I, somehow like can't really watch it so much because it makes me so sad because <laughs> like we all do these things on daily basis excluding so many people over super trivial unnecessary things the second thing is the racist camera phenomenon and um, i don't know if you have ever came across any of those but there are a lot of these like videos that tries to show how cameras deal with races or how face recognition algorithms deal with races for example, this, this photo here where Nikon camera looks at Asian people and says, that did someone blink? Or this video here that sadly I also have to skip, that, but this video is about HP face uh, recognition with a black person, so it, cannot, it can only recognize white people. But how? I mean, how did that happen? I don't really believe that technology is racist. Technology does not have feelings, right? The story is like this. Uh, this lady here, this uh, beautiful lady is called Shirley. She used to be the model of Kodak in the 50s. And this here is called the Shirley card, which used to be the standard color reference card for the photography industry in the 50s. Important thing to note here, this was an intentional thing. This did not happen by a mistake. In the 50s, they had this meeting and they asked themselves, 
do we really want to invest time into including black people? And the answer was, well, black people can't afford to buy cameras. Why try to involve them? Today, we are speaking in 2019, we don't even use films anymore, we have digital cameras, but we still have the implications of that from that time. And even though so many efforts are done by companies to fix this, this is still not fixed. One last example is the mysterious case of sexist airbags. Who here knows that when airbags were first released, they were less safe for children and women in comparison to men? And this happened again for exactly the same reason. The old male engineers team thought about the idea of taking their average height and weight to make test dummies, ignoring completely that there are other sizes of people outside this room, which ended up into this tragic outcome, which actually is a void product. It's a product that does not even do its job. What I'm trying to say here is you need to think about these things in every stage, right? I mentioned an example of development. I mentioned an example of testing. I mentioned an example of business. And Jessica earlier was speaking about um, things that like, relates to design and including people with ab like, uh, ableism, uh, with ab uh, disability, sorry. Um, so you need to think about that at every stage. And sadly, you cannot achieve that unless you have enough diversity in your team because false consensus. If people are all the same, they will not see beyond the things that they are all accustomed to. So yeah, what to do now? As a company, what you need to do is recognize this issue. This issue exists. This issue can damage your product. This issue can have a bad impact on your return of investment. Hire a diversity professional because actually those people exist, right? This is not like a, a thing that doesn't exist. This exists. And stop this behavior of, it's called pink washing. I don't know if someone heard this term before, but where you would put like an LGBT logo, but your product is still excluding LGBT people, right? Stop trying to capitalize over helping minorities while you are, as a company is the main damage, like one of the main factors damaging them. Try to actually do something for them. Try to listen when you have an employee that's underprivileged and complaining, because when they speak, they speak out of something. It's not, they're not just trying to bullshit they really have something that they can tell you. Make sure to guarantee this open and transparent communication framework for such issues specifically. Have code of conduct, try to have this talk with your employees all the time. And most importantly, stop shutting down the conversation. This conversation is very important to have. I have seen so many companies so scared of this conversation that once it comes up, they are just like, oh, let's, let's hide it, let's try to like, put it under the rug and not talk about it. Talk about these things, it's very important as us, as people who work for companies, you need to recognize the fact that you being a software engineer is on its own a privilege, right? Um, recognize this privilege and, and understand that we, you work in a candidate-driven market. Most of us can easily find jobs compared to other professions, right? Most of us are highly paid. So try to use this and also be very humble. Stop this attitude of thinking that you're so smart because you're not. Be humble and try to listen to people when they tell you stuff. Important, you are not as smart as you think. I am not as smart as I think. None of us in this room is smart as you think. So do your homework, try to study, try to research, try to read more before you just give judgment. And when you understand something, speak up for yourself, for others around you, for people in the warehouse in your company that are being exploited, not just for yourself. As a tech community member, Support all these diversity-related initiatives, right? I mentioned already women who code, Drails girls, Django girls. There are plenty that also targets, I don't know, people of color, refugees. Try to support these initiatives. But as I mentioned before, make sure to understand why are you supporting these initiatives. Not because you are cool, but because you are solving a problem that you are part of. Make sure to write about the topic. Make sure to speak in conferences and meetups. Push this conversation forward. Most importantly, if you are a white male, learn your role. You are an ally, you are, not the pro like you are not a victim. You are an ally. And understand what does it mean and what does it entail to be an ally. Okay, I'm almost done actually. Cool, so two things I would like to like, talk about before leaving. There is this statement that really gets on my nerves when people say things like, but why don't we all just be nice to each other and move on from this conversation? Why do we have to make a fuss about it, as I was saying before? I hope that you understand that 
your ability to be sick of politics, your ability to live this politics-free life is just a privilege in action, right? Your privilege is, is the thing that allows you to live this politics-free life. Because you're less likely to be a target of bigotry, attacks, deportation, exile, murder, much, much, much danger, like very, very dangerous things, you're less likely to be a target of. And that's why you don't see that. Your, your safety is not at stake, so you think that we can just move on and be nice. The second thing is this, I think that you are playing the victim card. Why? To get a diversity ticket? So, I don't know. I hope you also understand that it's really hard and exhausting to bring up the topics of oppression. Before giving this talk, I had to think so much because I was always giving like technical talks and people were like, yeah, this, this guy is cool. But I had to think so much before, should I really face people and tell them what I feel? Because it's hard, it's exhausting for me and for other people that are underrepresented much more than it is for you. We know that it's tiring, we know that it's annoying, but at the end, we are fighting for life and safety. We are not fighting for bullshit stuff as you think. So if you don't see that this is about our lives and safety, it simply is because of your privileges again. Thank you. <laughs>